Hey, welcome to the Master in Colour course. I'll be your tutor. My name is Richard Robinson. I'm in New Zealand and I've been a professional artist since 2001 and an art tutor for nearly as long as that as well. Uh, I teach workshops all around the world and I make videos which teach people online. So over a million people have seen my lessons so far. Now I asked a lot of my students what is the main stumbling block that you have when it comes to painting? And a surprising 72% of them said that color was their biggest stumbling block. So if color is your biggest problem with painting, you know, mixing colors, getting them right, then welcome to the club and you're in good company. So I thought, hey, I know a bit about color. I'll teach my students a lesson on color. So I started to try write down what it was that I knew about color. And it was that point that I realized that I'd actually been painting instinctively. And so I went on this personal quest at that time to find out as much as I could about color. And I spent months and months uh, scouring the internet, reading books, buying every DVD that I could on the subject and uh, built up a great treasure trove of information. And then once I'd assimilated all that and started using that uh, consciously in my own work, then I started teaching my workshop students about color in a really simple and practical way. So we had some great paintings come out of those workshops, but the thing that really touched me was when the light goes on in people's heads and they finally understand color and they can start to use it really practically in their paintings. It really turns it around from being a struggle to being a real joy. So now I want to share all of that learning with you. Some of the things we're going to cover in the course are color theory, seeing color, describing color, values, mixing color, manipulating color, color harmony, and light effects. So by the end of this course, you're going to have saved yourself years of struggle and you'll have a thorough understanding of color and how to use it in your paintings. So let's get you started with the first chapter, the history of color theory. I think it's important to know where we've come from in terms of our understanding of color so that we can see clearly where we are at the moment and know what discoveries have led us to this point. I don't want to bore you with the physics of light and everything, so I'll just give you a brief overview and make sure you know roughly how it all works so that you don't go believing something like what Plato first hypothesized in his emanation theory that an inner fire gives rise to visual rays shooting outward from the eye, interacting with the outer rays, and thereby allowing objects to be seen. Newton showed us in the 1700s that white light from our sun contains all the colors of the spectrum, the ones you can see in a rainbow, plus a whole bunch of others that we can't see, like ultraviolet and infrared. He then noticed the similarity between red and violet at either end of the spectrum and joined them together making a circle, the color wheel as we know it. And this was the birth of modern color theory. This knowledge didn't become practically useful to artists until Michel Chevrel, who managed the production of dyes for a French tapestry manufacturer, made the remarkable discovery that an intense dye color would produce the appearance of color on a surrounding neutral area, and that this new perceived color was almost directly opposite the original color on Newton's color wheel. Let's have a look at this visual phenomenon. Keep your eye on the middle of the orange square for the next 20 seconds. You'll see when I remove the square that a blue afterimage is formed in your eye, and blue just happens to be the complementary color of orange, meaning it's directly opposite orange on the color wheel. Again in France, the painter Eugène Delacroix used these new discoveries to further his own study of realistic lighting effects. He learned things like red cloth has greenish shadows, and the shadows of yellow objects have a tinge of violet in them. In doing this, he was able to break away from the classical dark backgrounds and dull tonal treatments of shadows and introduce color into shadows, effectively making the whole painting more vibrant. He was later reported to say that 
I can paint the skin of a goddess with mud, provided you let me surround it with the right colors. And this is actually possible too. If you surround a warm gray with a strong blue, it will actually resemble Caucasian flesh. The Impressionists were inspired by Delacroix's discoveries, and aided by the invention of a wider range of more vibrant paints, sold in easily transportable tubes, they painted outdoors, in search of a more meaningful expression of natural light and colour. Instead, they tended to paint in a mid or high key and add compliments to their lighter shadows. These artists included Monet, Renoir and Pizarro. In London at the same time, Joseph Turner was exploring bold colour and atmospheric effects which also had an effect on the work of the Impressionists. Meanwhile, George Seurat developed a very technical approach to colour a painstaking method called pointillism, which attempted to mix colours visually on the canvas rather than on the palette. To make a green, for example, he would place a small stroke of blue beside one of yellow, so that from a distance the two colours combine in the eye to create a more vibrant green than what could be achieved by mixing colour on a palette. This is actually how a modern four-colour printing press works, placing tiny dots of pure colour next to each other to create an image in the eye. But the process is just too taxing for most artists, so pointillism as a movement didn't last for long. Post-impressionists like Paul Gauguin and Van Gogh learned the techniques of the impressionist, but began to use colour in a more emotional manner. They were less concerned with the actual appearance of light and atmosphere than with emphasising the beauty of pure colour and line in a fairly flat picture plane. Van Gogh felt that colours had symbolic meaning, to him, yellow symbolized love and light, red and green conveyed passion and conflict, and deep blue was the color of spiritual rest, and gray was associated with surrender. Paul Cezanne's work can be seen as one of the bridges between the art of the 19th century and the 20th century. He used color almost as a chisel to shape objects, where he enjoyed the contrast of grayed color with saturated color. He wrote, when the colour achieves richness, the form attains its fullness also. Cezanne's work, along with others, inspired the Cubists, Expressionists and Fauves, who all used colour in an arbitrary fashion, no longer concerned with representing nature and her richness, but turning more to the inner world of the artist to draw inspiration from. Postmodernism was born and a gap of some hundred years ensued until today when we are seeing a resurgence in the academic popularity of representational art. Over that time, there have been artists who have kept the flame alive and passed it along to their own students, safeguarding the knowledge that was hard won over many years. Some include Russian artist Sergei Bongart, American Charles Hawthorne and Henry Hench. So through all these artists' efforts and many more, we now have a good understanding of what we can achieve with colour and painting. We're standing on the top of a mountain of discoveries and achievements, and we're now in the enviable position of having the knowledge and technology to achieve and paint a range and depth of colour expression that was simply not possible in the past. The next chapters are going to walk you through discovering your own power with colour so you too can climb up the mountain and see what the view is like from up there. Mm -hmm.